Great. Um, I uh, welcome you to throw me in the lake if I go past my seven minute window. And thank you guys for um, being so keen on the research talks today. Uh, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a microbiologist, and it's a great honor to, to be here today. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, How Might We Make uh, Cholera Diagnostics More Resilient uh, to the Negative Effects of Antibiotics and Lytic Phages. Now our lab is at the Emerging Pathogens Institute uh, at the University of Florida, and we really take a systems uh, level approach to think about the patient's journey in terms of onset triage, diagnosis, rehydration, antimicrobials, and ultimately how we convey those data and, and efforts onwards to people like yourself, the GTFCC. And um, uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here because I listen to your stories, and when I listen, I come up with the clinical and um, scientific research puzzles that I see um, you guys need the answers to, and then I bring that back to the laboratory. So what does that look like? On the leftward side, um, in terms of extending early access to care being ORS, we have a telemedicine service and medication delivery service we run nightly in Haiti to address problems we've had in the past. Um, in terms of triage, diagnosis, and rehydration, that clinical side, we build uh, clinical decision support tools uh, to aid in those processes. Um, one of those tools you see in the GTFCC app, which is a rehydration calculator. On the laboratory side, uh, we look at diagnostics, which I'll get into in a moment, as well as the mechanisms of drug resistance, the rates of uh, emergence of drug-resistant clones in patients, and then how that might inform antibiotic choice and if a drug should be used. All right, so we're going to dip into diagnostics. So to begin this, I want to kind of put you in the mindset of innovation. And to do this, I use a quote from Albert Einstein, which is, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the level of thinking we were at when we, being humanity, uh, created them. So we know that RDTs, at times, have inconsistent results. Biologically, we ask the question of why that might be. And to get into that question, um, I had uh, thoughts and experience around antibiotics and lytic phages from when I was a PhD student in Ferdosi Kadri's lab many years ago. And shown on the left is uh, four patient samples, one, two, three, and four. And these were patients we enrolled who said they did not take antibiotics. And what we did is we took their raw uh, a stool sample, diluted it 10 and 100 fold. We took that sample, boiled it so that the biological activities would be neutralized. And then we spotted it on a lawn of cholera and looked for zones of clearance. And what you'll see in patient number three are plaques that dilute linearly as you dilute them down. But in the boiled samples, patients one, two, and four have zones of clearing. So through a long journey of mass spectrometry, those zones of clearing are antibiotics that were in the patients that the patients didn't know that were in them, or at least didn't vocalize. Um, we went on to do a series of studies to show just the complete dissociation between what a patient says and the drugs that they shed. And there's many uh, thoughts around that, um, but it really speaks to this idea of antibiotic pollution in our clinical and then probably just life experience. So with this background, um, we looked in a 2015 study at a single site in Bangladesh in which we did um, APW grow out RDTs, and we found that among diarrheal samples posited by a technique called nanoliter uh, qPCR for cholera, the odds that the RDT was positive was reduced by more than 99% when azithromycin was present and detected by mass spec. The next question we asked was, how would lytic phage uh, affect this? And again, these are all viruses that infect and kill cholera. Um, and we found that among diarrheal samples positive again by nanoliter qPCR, the odds that an RDT was positive was reduced by 89% when those lytic um, phages were present. So we published this in JCM, and as you can imagine, there was a lot of discussion around this paper, which is fun in science, and definitely necessitated a larger multi-site validation study. And this was in part funded by the Wellcome Trust, so I thank them for their support. So in 2018, um, Ferdosi Kadri and her team and I ran a multi um, uh, center cluster randomized control trial with clinical endpoints in mind. But in that study, we captured samples from across the country um, to make a more generalizable um, study, and it also covered the entire arc of, of the year. The samples that we obtained, we did three things with. We did direct RDT, 
uh, we put them in transport media carry Blair and sent them to the ICD-DRB, which is shown in the middle with the blue triangle with the red center. Um, and then we also took that sample and immediately preserved it in RNA later, which stabilizes the nucleic acid because the phages are 10% uh, genome-wise nucleases. Um, those samples were then processed through qPCR for cholera, and then the three most common phages, ICP1, 2, and 3. So we've done a little bit of epidemiologic hunting, and this comes courtesy of other colleagues at UF and as well as David Sachs' group, in which we found ICP-1 not only in Southeast Asia, but it's found in the DRC, South Sudan, and Kenya. However, this ICP-2 and 3 has only um, been so far found in Southeast Asia and has, hasn't yet been detected in, in Africa. So we did these um, six tests, RDT, culture, and the four qPCRs, and we hypothesized that if we made a Venn diagram with the positive results, the circles for each of those results um, would overlap. So we looked at 2,574 samples, and then shown here is, are the plots of the positive results for the, each of those six tests, and they most definitely do not overlap. So taking kind of a traditional mindset to assessing diagnostics, we tend to want to take the RDT and put it against um, a gold standard, which might be qPCR for the gene TCPA. So the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value were 48%. 85%, 42%, and 88%. If we go on to look at culture, the same numbers are 30%, 97%, 72%, and 86%. And these numbers are not dissimilar uh, from our 2015 study. Okay, so what are the take-home points? The first is that antibiotics can reduce the odds of RDT positivity by over 90%. Lytic phage can do that um, by over 80%. Uh, percent, and that the idea of judging an RDT or other diagnostics against one gold standard might not be the best mindset. And so there's an alternative approach, which you take an in silico uh, approach using a process called latent class modeling to basically make an in silico a gold standard that you can pin um, your real diagnostics against. And that's an approach we took in that JCM paper, and his approach will continue to take forward. And my colleague Jason Andrews at Stanford uh, really heads up that um, line of modeling. So in terms of innovation, I think there's a lot of really exciting things that we can do. Uh, one is to think about building decision support on when an RDT should be used, in that you want to look at the overall context, the clinical picture, the epidemiologic picture, and then if an RDT is indicated, um, can you give a prediction on if that's a true positive versus a true negative? There's more biology to be done. We need to look at these mechanisms for why these various diagnostics um, have challenges. And then lastly, I strongly encourage that teams that are doing this line of work include uh, the primers for these phages into, into your molecular assays. Um, we're working on a diagnostic that's the same RDT that you guys use, but adding a test line for the ICP-1 phage, um, and that's in the works. So at the GTC, GTFCC, I challenge you to explore how might we make cholera diagnostics that are more resilient uh, to fit the needs of stakeholders like yourself, your community, but most importantly, your patients. So thank you. I appreciate it.